Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have given us another day of grace that we can come together and sing praises to you and hear about you and, and celebrate what you're doing in the lives of our youth as well as our, our aged. And God, we just thank you so much that you're the God, not of the dead, but you are the God of the living. And what a blessing it is to serve you, Lord. So we just ask that you, that you fill this service with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit from beginning to end so that we might give you the blessing, the glory, and the honor that you so richly deserve, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. And you guys may stand.
working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will. Cause you hide in the lowest valley. Yes, I will. Bless your name. Yes, I will. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy.
hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, you're a good, good father It's who you are Oh 
Gracious Father, thank you so much again for your word, for your truth, for the gathering. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the glorious truths that are contained in your holy book. And we pray that we hear from you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, today we come to our final message in the series on the Apostles' Creed. We've got to, it's got to come to an end at some point. But I've got to say, it's been a joy to go through this wonderful creed with you. Um, I've, it, it's been edifying to me. It's been encouraging to me. Uh, it, I, I, what I like about the Apostles' Creed is, is the perspective that it gives. Perspective that it gives us, whatever, regardless of what denominational tie we have, that we aren't just born in a vacuum, that we're connected to a long line of godly men and godly women who have been saying such things for ages, for literally ages. And unless the Lord comes back, maybe they'll be reciting it for ages more. So for the last time in our series, although we might add it to the service at some point, would you please recite the Apostles' Creed with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yes and amen. So since it ends with amen, keep that in mind. You, it is possible to pray the creed as a prayer to God. So it summarizes the core fundamentals of the Christian faith so well, and I, I strongly believe, I strongly believe that when, when Christians recite this or when they meditate on it, that God is immensely glorified. Amen? So even though it's, it's been repeated, uh, repeatedly said in weeks prior, it seems like the one day that I don't say it, somebody thinks that I'm endorsing something else. So just so you know, univer Catholic means universal. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the creed being uh, like we need to march on down the street to, to the Sacred Heart Parish. Uh, it simply means the universal church, the church at large. It means that if... Uh, one of the churches of First Baptist on the other side of the town said the creed, we would say it with them, yes and amen. Does that make sense? Okay. Every Orthodox, which is a fancy word for traditional Christian, can confidently affirm the truths that are contained in the Apostles' Creed because these truths are, in fact, just a summary of what the Bible teaches. So last week we talked about the forgiveness of sins. Can't talk about that enough in the Christian faith. We can approach God for forgiveness anytime. Amen? Anytime. There is no holy, universal, Catholic, if you want to say it, church of God without sinners being forgiven of their sins. All saints are forgiven sinners. It's not an elite club in the kingdom of God. There's no cliques. All the glory evermore to God. This is what this means. All the glory evermore to God for any good that you do or any good that I do. And that's okay. Amen? Amen? All right. So the sermon title for this morning is Life Everlasting. Life Everlasting. And we're looking at these final two lines of the Apostles' Creed. It says, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. See the prayer there? Amen. So we've looked at the past, the present, and we come once again to this future hope. For instance, we, we talked about in a previous message that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's future, right? Jesus is coming back. Oh, gosh. Jesus is coming back. 
So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 35 through 49. If you don't have your Bible, we have it on the screen. We're going to look at the resurrection of the body, which is the church, and eternal life beyond the grave. The grave is not the end. We won't have time to cover every aspect of these passages. This isn't the only place we'll be. But consider this as a flyover of the wonderful, encouraging, and true last few lines of the Apostles' Creed. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians. If we had time, we'd read the whole chapter, because this whole chapter is an exposition of the resurrection. But Starting at verse 35, but someone will say... How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, of a kind, is one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from stars in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the, dust, the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Amen? Amen. And indeed, we will in full, someday, bear the image of the man of heaven. Jesus is the word made flesh. He dwelt among us. He condescended from his throne of endless glory, and he endured the cross because of the joy set before him. That joy was to bring you and me and other sons and daughters to glory with him. He defeated the grave. Jesus is alive. And he rose to the right hand of God the Father. And so because he rose, we too shall rise. We will not be abandoned to the pit. So question. This has several meanings today, but do you like endings? Think about it. Do you like endings? Do you like when things end? And so, eh, sometimes, right? Depends on what it is. Have you, have you ever watched a good movie only to stop right at the climax? I'm done. You watch it all the way up to the point where the story reaches its peak only to turn it off and there might only be 15 minutes in it, 15 minutes left. What about when reading a book? If you're not a movie watcher, what about books? Do you ever pick up a book, get all the way to the last two chapters, and then put it down and you're like, ah, you know what, I'm done. I don't think that's the usual experience. But what if the creed, we're talking about an ending here, what if, what if the Apostles' Creed didn't have these last two lines, and more importantly than that, what if the Bible didn't talk about what happens next? The final chapters of the Bible tell you a lot. The last two chapters of the Bible tell you a lot about the ending. And when I say ending, I'm using that term extremely loosely, extremely. So imagine if we didn't have any of this available. Imagine if the ending was left out. What's next? It's not left out. And this story, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody 
all about somebody, is his story. It's not about me. There's a final act, this side of glory, that is yet to be played out. And there really is, if you like fairy tales, this is better. This is a real, happily, ever, after. We get the grace of knowing. That's a grace of knowing how the story ends because God tells us how it ends. The Bible says he reigns from heaven and he does whatever he pleases. He works everything according to the counsel of his will. What confidence does that give you? What confidence, better yet, what confidence should it give you? The Bible says we've been sown in a perishable body, but we will be raised in an imperishable body. So let's go ahead and look at our first point. Our bodies will be transformed to be like Jesus' glorious body. That's got to be good news for somebody. Our bodies will be transformed to be like Jesus' glorious body. Uh, Philippians 3.21, Philippians 3.21 says it this way, who Jesus will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That same power. So you and I are going to get new resurrected bodies. Jesus will do this for us when he returns. The Lord accomplishes what he sets out to do. Nothing takes him by surprise. He will build his church. What are, what are, what the, what are the gates of hell? What do they do? Are they going to win? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against his church because he's the one that empowers his church. The Bible says he shall have dominion from sea to sea. There's not an iota that is not going to fall under the reign of Christ in full when he returns. Amen? Amen? We eagerly await that day. The Bible says that too. The whole creation is longing, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And so we should be eagerly waiting for the redemption of our bodies. This is something to look forward to. This is something to look forward to. Pivot. Are you suffering? Are you suffering? Are you in pain? I want you to know that there is no pointless suffering. Pain has a point. It doesn't feel good, but it has a point because the Bible tells us that all things, not some things, all things are working together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The Holy Spirit has given us life and yet death. You're thinking about it right now. Death continues to claim victims. Presently, it appears that Christ isn't king, but that the Grim Reaper is king. And the reason that we feel that way is because death is still a reality in this present existence. It's still here. Unless Jesus comes back, which we hope and pray always that he does, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. The grave awaits us all. We will. You can't dodge it. You can try to opiate yourself to it. You can kind of look at something else. But you can't dodge the fact that the grave is coming. Death is coming. And even though it doesn't look like it or feel like it some days, we can confidently say that death has been defeated. Death has been dealt with. Death sting. It has no power because of the finished work of Jesus' resurrection. So what about the resurrection of your body? What about this body? Body's past, body's future. What will happen when Jesus comes to claim his church? Will our spirit go to be with the Lord without a body? 
Or is the body coming too? Or is there a third option? So some of the religious Jews didn't believe in the resurrections. Re- resurrection, yeah. Sadducees. We've heard of the Sadducees. I'll, I'll let Nate tell the dad joke about Sadducees. You see, they didn't believe in the... I'm, I'm going to tell it now. Sorry, Nate. They didn't believe in the resurrection, so that's why they were sad, you see? <laughs> there you go, buddy. The Greeks... So there was a lot of Greek thought around this time, too, um, of, of Paul writing this. The Greeks believed in an afterlife, but not a physical resurrection. Just an essence, just your spirit, but not, not physical. So the Apostles' Creed comes against that idea... Very strongly. You can't get around it. Bodily resurrection is what the Apostle Paul addresses for us in 1 Corinthians 15. So if you're looking at verse 36, if you look at verse 36, it says, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Got some agricultural language. Jesus said in the Gospels, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The whole body, or substance of the grain, except the germ, dies in the earth or is decomposed. And this decomposed substance begins this nourishing process for the germ inside the seed to support itself in the ground. Thus we get the term to germinate. The first form of the seed has to be cast aside to make room for the next phase of the seed's life. And that next phase is becoming a plant. And that leads to a new look and a beautiful harvest. So as you think of this illustration that the Lord gave us, we we have to realize that God loves, loves redemption and restoration loves it. Do you like to, and, and I think some of you do too, do you, do you like to improve or attempt to place order in the chaos that's going on around you? You just let things happen. If you're, if you're a let things happen person, eventually that chaos is going to catch up with you. And you got to take charge and you got to get in there and do something to put some order. God is a God of order. God is not a God of confusion. And he loves to take something and restore it. So the reason that we are like that is because we bear the image of God. See, see, it's in in verse 38. Verse 38 says it this way. God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So even in the plan of redemption, God ordered it, and he's still at work in his creation. He's not, he's not removed. He's still at work. He's redeeming, and he's restoring. And every time you see a sinner call upon the Lord, you are seeing the work, the restorative work of the Holy Spirit come into that person. It's amazing. Does a farmer sow plants? No. A farmer sows seed. How do they become plants? Well, we could get scientific, biological, but let's just make it simple. God makes them plants. God makes the seed become a plant. We might water, we might sow, but God causes the increase. And so when that seed passes away, the plant takes its place. The seed's gone, and the plant remains. New life brings a new glory. Glory. Glory in this context, what what we'll call it for today, is the wonder and the beauty that emanates from the character of God. Okay? Emanating beauty from the person of God. If something has glory, if something is glorious, it received that glory from God. Also, different parts of creation have different glories about them. There's a glory for humanity. There's a glory for birds and fish and for animals. And then there's a difference in glory between the earthly and the heavenly. There's a terrestrial splendor. And there is a celestial 
splendor. And all of this comes from the glorious king who created it all. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The splendor of the king. Did you got a song in your head now? Robed in majesty. He made it all. Again, if anything has a glory, it is because the glorious one who shared it with his creation. He's sharing life. The earthly glory of God is down here. Summer, winter, springtime, harvests. And then you have a heavenly glory that is sun, moon, and stars and their courses above. And yet they're all made from God. They all have their same genesis in God. And here's the point. There is a bodily glory that you and I have not yet experienced. There is more concerning what we will be than what we currently are. And I mean more. So I'm going to quote Albert Barnes. He says it this way. In a manner like the grain that is sown, and to the different degrees of splendor and magnificence in the bodies in the sky and on the earth, The dead shall be raised in a manner analogous to the springing up of grain, and there shall be a difference between the body here and the body in the resurrection. So looking at verses 42 and 44 again, and I apologize if my my microphone decides to yell at me. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. At least it was polite. It let me finish the verse. Thank you. So look at the comparisons of the, of the now versus the what will be in this passage. Let's see. In my coat pocket, let's try this. So the other lesson for today is you have to learn to laugh at yourself. or People are going to laugh at you anyway. You might as well join them. And it's not a question of when you say something silly or if. It is a question of when, see? Oh, man, that's good. I couldn't have done that. Holy Spirit humor right there. Because my lad, don't don't be attributing something to me that I, yeah. (laughs) You've heard the joke about, oh, my goodness. This is, we're, Okay. You heard the joke about uh, this guy, he comes, he's, he's like, I got this song. I got this song from God. He gave me this. And then they start playing it for you. And, the, and it just doesn't seem like it's very anointed. And the guy says, you know, I know you said God gave you that song. You might want to give it back. <laughs> Nobody said that to me yet. All right. If there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. So we look at the, the, look at the comparison again between, between the now, between what ha- what's happening now, and the what will be that's laid out for us by the Apostle Paul. We're sown in dishonor. We're brought forth in, in dishonor. That means, that means we come out of our mother's womb sinning. We're born in sin. And yet... We will be raised in glory. Sin's curse will not have dominion in our new body. Isn't that awesome? In the true sense of the word. The perishable body is sown in weakness. And the older we get, the more we experience weakness and frailty. I sneezed the other day. And Marie was like, what's wrong with you? I said, I sneezed and half my body hurts. This is new. 
new mercies I see, new frailties I see. So the older we get, the more we experience that. So things, things may not be, some of you are about to give this an amen, things might not be working as well as they used to. In the bodily resurrection, it will be raised in power. We won't have to deal with weaknesses or infirmities anymore. So finally, the body is sown naturally. This is the present context. But it is raised spiritual. But there's still a body. There's still a body. And this is, this is supernatural. And it is given to us by the Spirit of God. So we've got a temporal reality and we have an eternal reality. So we've talked about this recently, but, but, but verse 45 calls Adam a living being, and the last Adam, Jesus, a life-giving spirit. We have the very presence of God with us in the person of the Holy Spirit right now. He's with you wherever you go. That's how Jesus can be at the right hand of God the Father And still with you, as he said, fear not, I'm with you, even until the end of the age, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ. So think of the differences between Adam and Jesus. So Adam was created. We have that in common with Adam. Created, he was formed of the dust. He came into being. He was not always there. That is not so with Jesus. Jesus has always been. He is God's only begotten Son. Begotten, not created. Not the same thing. And we see that all over the Holy Scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you you zoom down a few verses in that passage, and it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Adam sinned in a garden of perfection. Jesus never sinned. Adam is a man. Jesus is God. That's the biggest difference. Adam is a man. Jesus is God. But just as we are born naturally in Adam, we are born spiritually through Jesus. Everyone is born by nature in Adam. Everyone. Everyone under the sun. You don't get to dodge this one. You don't get to pick your family. Everybody's family with Adam and Eve. Those who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior are born of God and bear the image of the man of heaven. So, I'm going bring it back to where we started for a minute. How are you feeling about life in the present Is it everything you want it to be? Have you ever been doing something, you've been having so much fun or enjoying something or whatever it was you were doing, man, I don't ever want this to end. I won't quote country music. I don't want it to end. There's a lot of country songs that say that. I don't want this to end. This is so much fun. And yet it always does end. Ultimate satisfaction, this side of glory, is not possible. That's because the world in its current condition, just like your body, is temporary. It won't always be that way. But I believe this is also the reason that we tend to get bored with things. You ever get bored with something? Like, man, once I have that right there, don't tell me this hasn't happened to you. They advertise it on TV, you see it on the billboard, you're like, man, if I had that, I'd be happy. That guy on TV, he looks a lot better than me. If I have that product, I will look like that. And I get that, and it's like, man, that's not true. I'm still bald. (laughs) That's a a little bit of a fabrication. I have. So it's the reason I believe that we, get to, we tend to get bored with things is because the world is temporary. So when we abuse things for satisfaction at the same time, if, we're like, if we just want to continually be pleasured and satisfied 
and doing things that no, dull us to the environment. There, there, is, there are repercussions for overindulging. Eventually that pleasure train will come to an end and it won't be soft, it'll be a crash. So despite what the song says, oh gosh, I'm sorry country music, too much of a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. Depends on what that thing is. That's when times are going well, though. What I've just described to you is when you're in something and you're enjoying it. You want it to keep going, but you know it must end. Then there are times when things aren't going well and we can't wait for it to end. This needs to stop. Tragedy. The pain, the loss, the anxiety, depression, stress, you name it. It's usually our low moments, though, with this current topic. It's the low moments where our perspectives are the most accurate about life. The poor, the downcast, the hurting, the suffering, the despairing, those folks tend to long for a better day and a greater existence in a world that seems far away. So allow me to use another illustration. Let us consider camping. Do you like camping? All right, on the count of three, I want you to say yes or no if you like camping. One, two, three. No. Oh, that was very mixed. That was a mixed bag. So camping can be a lot of fun. But unless you're the nomadic type, the place you call home likely possesses more of the amenities that make you feel rooted as a person. So some of you don't like camping, and you're probably the, to those of you that do, you might not get the analogy as well, but stick with me. Those of you that don't will get it. So when when you're at home, you're like, yes, this is my bed, this is my bathroom, there's my books, there's my couch, here we go. So what if I told you, though, that in a sense, we're all camping right now? You're camping. We're sojourners, the Bible says. We're pilgrims. We are camping. Because Hebrews 13, 14, Hebrews 13, 14 says it this way. Here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. There's a city built with rooms for all of you. For all of us. Because we belong to the bridegroom. And he went to prepare a place. In Jesus' house, there are many rooms, and there is a specific place built for you. There are aspects of heaven that touched earth. But we have not experienced the fullness of heaven here. We travel. We camp, go on vacation, but you can only journey so far. Journey's got to end at some point. Even if we still desire, it's like, okay, well, let's just go back to God, right? That's been tried before. Let's just go back to God. We can't get to the city because it's going to be, here's the thing. If we desire to resurrect the idea, we got more technology today. We also know more about what's in outer space. So if we decided to resurrect the idea of the Tower of Babel, I still don't think that would work out very well for us. But we don't have to worry about getting there because it's going to be brought to us. It's just not here yet. The heavenly Jerusalem, as the Bible said, is going to come down to earth. And that's only the beginning. So let's look at our second point. Better start moving. Jokes are holding me up. Some darn jokes. Number two, when Jesus appears, we shall dwell with God face to face. Exactly. Amen. If this is not the deepest longing of your heart, I pray that it is. 
This is where peace, joy, and love will be experienced in their absolute fullness. 1 John 3, 2 says it this way, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. That is intimate language. This is knowing our God in the fullest sense. We, we approach the throne of God right now, right? We just did it earlier in prayer. But we don't see him. There are things, there are unseen realities all around us. We're stained by the effects of the fall, but when the curse is removed, we will, if you like the word literally, we will literally approach the throne of God. And we will see the king, that splendorous king, clothed in majesty, wrapped in glory upon his throne. And we won't see him far off, we'll see him face to face. John 17, Jesus prays this way, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, that is the church. You've got a prayer, we've got the heart of Jesus right here. I pray that they may see the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The glory that Jesus prays to share with us has not been experienced yet. She's excited. She gets it. Let that kid worship in the spirit. She's like, you come down here and let her worship in the spirit, right? So that glory, that, that, that what Jesus is praying about, this is my question for you and your heart. Like, so what? Don't be so what about this. Okay? Do you want it? Do you long for this? Do you long to see the Lord face to face? So let's pull up Revelation 22. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. I want to read these verses to you. Allow this passage to set your mind on things above. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and the servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. When you think of Eden, there's a little bit of bitterness there, isn't there? Nobody thinks of the Garden of Eden and they're like, oh, yeah, awesome. Until you get to the third chapter of Genesis and you think, oh, man, that reminds me of where I was. That's called paradise lost. When I think of the second coming, I think of paradise restored. Remember that restoration? When God restores something, it tends to be better than it was when it was originally created. We lost the garden we're going to get a city, a city of gold and beautiful precious stones. The river from Eden was cut off. But when Christ returns, we'll have access to the river, the water of life that flows straight from the throne of God. We lost access to the tree of life, but we will have eternal access to it once again. There will be no more curse. And with no more curse, that means there's no more sin. That means no more hurt. That means no more sorrow. That means no more sickness, distress, pain, or anguish. That also means that this decaying, weak, temporal body won't have a place in the new heavens and the new earth. You're going to need some better garments for this party because this one lasts forever. So see that. 
See it. See the restorative power of God. See the redemptive power of God. He made it better. He takes something that's dark and makes it beautiful. We lost our access to God himself. Perhaps of all the things that I just described of you, the biggest one is right here. We lost access to God himself. We get it back. And we don't just get it back in part. Like Moses asked God, show me your glory, show me your glory, show me your glory. I can't, Moses, it'll kill you. It's in full. No longer exiled. Bearing the mark of God visibly. Light won't be an issue. We won't have to worry about day and night. Light will emanate from his very essence. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That, my dear friend, is life everlasting. Life in the truest sense of the word. Life in full. And the life that is in full never ends. The last enemy to be defeated is what? Death. Death will be gone forever. We will share in dominion with the Lord. We will have that life together. Nothing compares to what awaits us on that glorious day when Jesus comes back. We are citizens of heaven and we will be even more so than we ever were here. If you can't imagine it, that's okay, because you can. I just tend to go to the things of wonder. Think of the things of a child, the wondrous things that childs, the children dream of. I don't know what we'll be able to do in heaven. You've got some people saying you're going to walk through walls. Some people are saying you're going to fly. You can eat. That's good. Come on. Those fair people. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. Animals are at peace. United with brothers and sisters who've gone before us. And you might see some that you never knew coming behind us. Isn't that cool? And I just want to say that, that, that there is a lot of things. And thank you to the worship team. Because this is the kind of stuff that's worth singing about. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. I love that song. There's a, there's a, and all, and all the Charles Wesley folks, they know, hear him, ye deaf, give praise, ye dumb, ye loosen tongues, employ. Ye blind, behold. This is incredible. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come and leap, ye lame, for joy. Augustus top lady, while I draw this leading breath, when mine eyes shall close in death. What's he say? He says, when I soar to worlds unknown and see God seated on his precious throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me. And then, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. This is the description of life everlasting. There is more gladness. There's a contemporary song that says it this way. There is more gladness longing for the sight than to behold or to be filled by anything. That is incredible. Everything sad, as Mr. Tolkien wrote, will be made untrue. So we come to the close. Yes, I am almost done. You like you were you should have been done about 15 minutes ago. I don't know, actually. Worship team, if you guys want to come up. close how we began and that's exactly what this ending is like do you like endings sometimes we don't like endings 
You ever experienced that too? You're like, man, I just finished this book series. I wish there was another book. And we don't like those kind of endings because we're enjoying the object we were consuming or the story we were reading. But this ending, the truest ending, this is the best kind of ending because this is the kind of ending that doesn't end. It's actually a beginning. So it isn't a fairy tale. There's no horse-drawn carriage with a happily ever after stapled to the back of it. But I'm going to tell you it's better than fiction. Because it's a real happily ever after. It's not made up. It's real. And so if you haven't declared that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I implore you, do it now. Do it now. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and sin will be dealt with. That's a good thing. I know it's like we think about that like, oh man, no, my sin. No, sin will be dealt with. It's gone. And when he comes, he will come to bring us life in full that never has an ending. And we call that life everlasting. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish. But what will they have, church? Everlasting life. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Give us eyes fixed on heaven. As, as it says in the Scriptures, give us, give us eyes, give us hearts that long for things of above, not on things of earth. And help us to remember that in our day-to-day, whether it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, keep it stamped, keep eternity stamped before our eyes to remember that Jesus is coming back, and when he does, there is no pleasure, there is no enjoyment, there is no fun, there is no amount of goodness in the present existence that's even going to touch the glory that is awaiting for the sons and the daughters of God that you are bringing with you. Give us that heavenly perspective, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.